It's March 2020, and this is Wow Signal Burst number 33. Astronomer David Blank commenting on episode 41. This is your host, Paul Carr. When we put out episode 41, which consisted primarily of an interview with Beatrice Villaroel in November of 2019, I asked at that time if there are any astronomers who wanted to comment on her results and her methods to please contact me. And David Blank, who's an astronomy professor in Australia, although he's presently in the United States, contacted me and said he'd like to make some comments. And so I called him up and we recorded this interview on March 6, 2020. David Blank got his doctoral degree in astronomy at the University of Sydney in 1999. His doctoral research was on radio observations of safer galaxies, which are a dimmer version of quasars. He is currently associated with the University of Southern Queensland in Australia and is doing work on extrasolar planets. David Blank, you contacted me about Beatrice Villarreal and Company's yes. paper. When I first put out the episode with her on it about her most recent paper, I asked astronomers out there if you have any comments, uh, ne positive or negative or otherwise, I'd like to hear from you. And you're the you, you responded to that. So uh, let's let's get started with your impressions of the paper and and what you. And what you think is uh, good, bad, positive, negative, uh, interesting, not interesting, and we'll just go from there. Well, overall, I think it's a very fascinating paper. And, and as a methodology, I can't find anything to fault in it. I see some things in addition, but then again, I can't fault them either because you don't put everything in one paper you often, um, unless you um, want to um, hunt. We don't normally have 200-page papers, so <laughs> everything gets staggered into small into um, smaller bits. Right. Now, I, I would point out that when I talked to her, she she mentioned, you know, uh, this was all done in a shoestring, right? There was almost no funding. Or probably oh, no, yeah, I got Probably no that. funding. Uh, uh, just her, her and her friends working voluntarily on this project. Uh, and they're looking for for follow-up observations. That, that's really what they're trying to do with the papers, trick, is to stimulate that. I, there were some comments I make that she's probably not aware of, but I hear, you know, the, from people I know who about um, the um, Harvard plates. Oh, okay. One of them is that um, a lot of them from the 1940s were destroyed. In the forties, okay. Now that's yeah. not that's not the Menzel gap, right? That's something else. Oh yeah, so you know of that. Oh yeah, well we we did a a couple of episodes about the Harvard plates with Doctor Schaefer, and also Doctor Joshua Grinley. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we we did a couple episodes in that. They mentioned the Menzel gap, but I didn't know anything about the forties. I thought the forties were solid. Um, forties and fifty. I mean, there's a good there's a reasonable account of it in um, Dorit High. Hoflite's autobiography that she left basically because of that. That there was a that Menzel decided that for the Harvard College Observatory that they wanted to switch focus from what they thought that old fat you know things about positional astronomy astrometry is kind of old hat, and they wanted to um, go into astrophysics. So going old hat didn't mean just. Um, Changing interest, it meant destroying some of the um, data from that era. It was Menzel who decided to destroy some some of these. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's, it's um, she talks about a lot of the plates were simply taken out of their temperature controlled environment and just put out, um, literally to um, rot. Oh, I had no idea. No, she talks about. It. Of course, I should say we're only getting one view of it. 
but we did know that Menzel didn't like it and that they were destroyed and him being director that, um, well, the onus has to be on him. Also. So some of the lights in the 40s were lost? Or all I of think them? it was the 40s. It might have been the 50s. I haven't read a longer biography, but it was a, a significant um, number of years. Yeah. Okay. And um, and that um, Dorot Hoflight writes about um, that some of the plates were made unusable because, you know, you have these long, thin glass plates and they... Um, you know, they don't stay flat. They, um, what do you call it? They um, curve and... Um, Essentially, they degrade. Is what they you're... degrade and also they become, they, they don't longer be even flat. So if you try to re read it, that you lose positional information. Oh, I see. Yeah. And, uh, you know... I, I mean, Which is I, important I, for high proper motion objects. Yeah, right. I mean, for right. anything, if it's a little bit of proper motion and you want to something, decide whether it's a little proper motion or something that's truly stationary or post the stationary, right. you lose that um, that positional information, or, or it degrades, is a better way of putting it. I mean, they, they, you can't do anything about it now. Understood. So, uh, but what I thought it was a fascinating paper, the one other thing I know is that they're using, they're using Naval Observatory data, and mm -hmm. I understand that the positional information is, you know, is great, but the photometry is... Um, may not be so accurate. Not totally dis unaccurate or but it's but it's not the most accurate. Okay. Although I mind you I'm not a specialist, but what some people have used it have told. And uh, these are the but these are the plates had, that were taken with uh the Palomar Observatory. Yeah, I mean that was the this is the Naval Observatory one I'm talking about. Right, but yeah USNO. Yeah, but USNO, but they were using the, the Palomar. Oh plate. yeah, they were using a whole lot of this, but yeah. In other words, uh, my my point is is that uh, considering what's happening is they're doing as great a job as they could have. <laughs> they did. Yeah, I understand. And, and uh, I know that Dr. Villarreal has looked very really hard at the, those old uh, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. those old Palomar plates to make sure she had some evidence of the objects before and after. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was impressed by that. One thing is is that I know that some of the observatories in the East Coast. Actually, this occurred to me earlier today, by the way, while I was thinking about this, that you had some of the observatories established in the 19th century by, um, you know, that the University of Pittsburgh, University of Virginia, the few of them had these large refractors, and again, they were into positional astronomy. They were finding the, following the motion. So I had no idea how big this coverage was, and but that's a possible source. I don't think they've been digitized now, unfortunately. So hmm. trying to get it may be difficult to actually go back and use it. But anyway, that's something that occurred to me today. Perhaps I'll email her and just. Well, I want to point out, and all these things I'm saying, it makes it, her achievement even more impressive rather than having, you know, having data which has various issues. Yes. Yeah. Well, even very, very good data has issues, right? <laughs> oh, that's true. But <laughs> you know, data from tests or data from Hubble all has this has little quirks that are, that the experts need to work through. Right. Have you concluded anything about Dr. Vera Laurel's? Uh, you know, she she found a, a certain set of objects on the USNO catalog. Right. That, given reasonable assumptions about proper motion, don't seem to be there anymore. Yeah, but that's tricky, you know, with proper motion, because not only is it nearby, you have to worry. I mean, something which is next to you and going towards, directly towards you is not going to have any proper motion or very little. Right. On the other hand, something which is much farther but is going across the field of view may, um, will, will appear to have more. So when you say about things having large proper motions being near you, you can only say that in a statistical sense. Understood. Yes. Uh, the proper motion does depend on the geometry and, and by in general large proper motion means probably closer to you than one that's small yes probably yeah of course now now we have pretty good pretty good uh parallax measurements of a lot of stars oh, yeah, yeah. From, Gaia, Ga from gaia yeah can can we can you sort of encapsulate for me your opinion and then we'll drill down a little bit uh uh, your overall view of the of the uh, Vasco work and and 
you know, what what stars are really missing and what stars may not are probably not missing because of some some other reason. I mean, one thing I will say though, um, that um, I suspect there may be new phenomena there. And um, one thing I was in seeking intriguing, she talked about various flash stars that could that could um, increase their brightness, you know, many magnitudes. She didn't say much about uh, the various extragalactic uh, objects that do that. She just briefly mentioned active some out the galaxy, but you could have some of them like be a, la- a class called be a lax where you could have a you know comparable increase and maybe not come you could have four or five magnets easier easily within a few days hmm. and and for all we know there are even more extreme versions that operate um that that um operate on um um, that um, we've missed because they're not. Okay, let me rephrase this. Okay, that they could be some. Ex- there could be some rare extreme versions of this. And I, I was thinking of that. And one other thing I was thinking about is that is that you know there've been whole sky s- surveys done at other wavelengths. I don't believe she mentioned a two mass survey, which is in the infrared. Right. And you have others. You have X rays, like X ray surveys. And you have radio surveys. The trick is, is that their resolution is not nearly as good as the optical in general. Mm-hmm. Most of that, their um, all sky is five arc seconds, which means if you're looking, if you have a proper motion of a few arc seconds, you might be able to confuse it with other things there. It's a bit tricky, but um, that's something that may be worth while at some point. And, and I'm particular, the VLA right now is doing the very large all sky survey, which is rather sensitive. It's going to be something like a, at least a factor of 10 more sensitive than the first survey, which they did in the 90s. First, I forget what, that's an acronym, not. <laughs> no. And um, and it's going to be of several epics and they're getting other information like polarization. So that would be interesting to compare it when it's, when it's, not, when it's available. Right. Well, I mean, we're many years away now, but W first will give us a, a yeah. very good sky survey. Oh yeah, that's true. So there's, uh, I mean, she's just one group, so I can't. It's not fair to say you didn't do this, 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 this. I'm just saying that there's room for a lot of people to work in. I think she narrowed it down to about 100 objects that she thought yes. were the most interesting. Right. And and the brightest, you know, that that could be followed up on. They're kind of out of the range of amateur telescopes, but they're not out of the range of professional. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think they were like 17th or 18th magnitude. In yeah. The so, I mean, well within the range for for most profession, for all professional telescopes that I know of. Um, and, of course, uh, W first will easily go down that to those yeah. magnitudes. I should say that a large amateur could do something if uh, that – Although it'd be tricky, and um, that again, they're uh, they're actually the um, the actual error, the uncertainty would, would be fairly great because I I supervised a student who did who this issue came up, mm-hmm. and that um, for short exposures, say when we reach about magnitude fourteen to fifteen, you're getting errors of the order of well perhaps ten to fifteen percent. Uh huh. That's well, enough to know if it's there or not. Right, but it's still a pretty big area. Yeah. yeah. A large part of her paper was was intended to say, "Can we have some follow up follow up observations, please?" <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> we have no money, uh, we need your help. Uh, and, and if you go to some large institution like the Hubble Space Telescope, and you say, "We'd like to follow up on these things," they'll say, "Well, your chances of success are are poor." So. You know, you don't get the telescope time. And when I talked to Bradley Schaefer, he was saying, yeah, things that get the expensive telescope time are the things that have a very good chance of returning a result. That is true. So, you know, going fishing doesn't doesn't get you. Yeah, that's the technical term, by the way, as you know. (laughs) Yeah. Fishing expeditions are they don't generally don't get past the committee that allocates these these things. Um, 
I would like to see, I would, as, as a non astronomer, I would love to see them allocate a small amount of time to small bets. Uh, yeah. That would small, unlikely things that, that still have a lot of intelligent professional backing, but apparently that's not the practice at, at present. There's one telescope where that's actually encouraged. That's Which one the is Green that? Bank telescope. Green Bank. Oh. They said um, projects that, you know, that are uncertain success, but potentially high impact are encouraged. That's how they put it. Well, that, good for them. <laughs> Of course, radio radio isn't going to help us find missing stars necessarily, but uh, for the most part, that's true. The uh, what we really need, it, I mean, if some of her hypotheses are correct, right? We need infrared telescopes because these things have uh, have lost so much brightness. Now, now she is an extragalactic astronomer, uh, Beatrice Villarreal. She got her PhD in in galaxies oh uh, i didn't know that act, active galaxy nuclei you're not going to get your phd in seti <laughs> yeah, no, uh, well i shouldn't say that. i should i shouldn't say that uh there are people now at penn state who are getting their phds in yeah, seti I'm gonna say that. yeah uh but you know future phd um yeah uh but uh she had to go with some a more respectable <laughs> topic so she's well aware of what you know you can get quasars and other active galactic nuclei that flare up and then disappear so if they were flared up during the time of the of the palomar survey they might have well disappeared and be beyond the below the limiting magnitude of anything we have now mm -hmm. and you know you're not going to get james webb space telescope time for that kind of search within our lifetimes <laughs> oh by the way when the first deep um, image um, deep, deep survey was done with the um, Hubble telescope in the mid '90s, they had a very hard time um, getting um, convincing that it was worthwhile to do. And um, they, you know, they had an area of the sky, um, small area of the sky, which had nothing there, and they asked for you know something like 50 orbits. If you sit in an orb, each orbit being something like 90 minutes, that's a huge amount of time. Right. And it turned out they, were, they had spectacular success, but I remember reading, they were talking about it was controversial beforehand. Finally, they said, why not? Well, it did get approved, but yeah, it took... It, it did get approved. <laughs> it took some it selling, good. yes. <laughs> and that, that, that turned out to be one of the best things they ever did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think this, I heard this from Mark Dickinson, I think um, was, was, he was the first author on the, you know, for a lot of them. Can you summarize for me uh, what you think of uh, the past, present, and future? I, it's really interesting what you said about the plates. I didn't know that. and what, That's going to recall there's some follow-up. I might have to, have to contact Dr. Grinley about that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, okay, uh, just say uh, I could. This is stuff I hear, you know, face to face, and I, it's interesting. And um, Darren Hofflight's autobiography is well worth reading, by the way. Oh well, I'll check that out for sure. Um, okay, uh, and so, uh, do you have any? Um, uh, you've already had some words of praise for the Via Roll. Oh yes, paper. this is this is a tremendous piece of work. Uh, what would you like to? Say? What kind of follow-up do you think is the most promising? Well, for me, actually, I'm um, looking at other wave bands. Although, again, since the position though is not going to be quite as good, it's going to be. But on the other hand, if you find something that looks intriguing, that's not too far away, it may be possible to get observing time, in which case you do have something. Hey, we have something that's close to a position. There's it is potentially something there. It's not quite fishing because you know there's something there to follow up. And you could see whether um, the position better aligns because these radio surveys and x-ray surveys, uh, they, as I said, their um, resolution is um, instead of um, 
I mean, optical resolution is typically an arc second or better, but a radio could be anywhere from, could be anything from under an arc second to tens of arc seconds. And I know in the first survey, it's about four, four or five. And in another one called the NVSSS named at the same time, it's like 45. Mm. So if you so a 45 arc second area is going to cover a lot of stars. Yes. So, um, but on the other hand, you found something really interesting that may justify it. And certainly with the first survey being a few arc, being a few arc seconds, not that much worse than the optical. Yeah. Now you mentioned something about the, the VLA is currently conducting a survey. Oh yeah. They're calling the very large, um, sky survey. And uh, they're getting a tremendous amount of work. I mean, doing a tremendous amount of data. They've done a small part of it has been released to the public. Although it's not the uh, what they call best quality yet. How, how much resolution are they getting? In this case, I think if I recall, they're using it. They're using using what's called the eight configuration. That is the VLA. The antennas are spaced according to different configurations. In the A configuration, the antennas are spaced out the most, so you get the um, highest resolution. And in the D, they're most compact, but um, so you get less resolution. But you have the advantage that very extended radio emission you don't miss, which you would in the uh, extended. Right. It's sort of, I mean, another analogy we're seeing. Imagine you take a photograph of a person with high resolution. You see their eye, you see their eye, you see their, pu their pupils, you see their nostrils, but you don't see the nose or the eyebrows. <laughs> and then a low resolution, okay, you won't see the pupils so good, but you'll see that there is a nose and you'll see that there's eyebrows. That's one way of thinking it. Uh, just, I'll let, let you uh, give me any other thoughts you have and then we'll wrap it up. Well, I mean, there's a lot of follow-up. I was intrigued by some of the things she said, like failed supernova. That that was a new one for me. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder, she did some follow-up of this one, and they did to really deep magnitude, something like 25 magnitude. Yeah. And again, I wonder if they went a few more, because I, I wonder if, whether they would have found a galaxy if they went a few magnitudes deeper. And the other thing I didn't mention was the whole thing about the fast radio bursts, which you know were recently discovered. Right. Yeah. There's been some discussion whether there any out whether there would be any optical counterparts. Right. And there was a few observate there were a few attempts that haven't been then successful. But if they're talk if these fast radio bursts are occurring as frequently as thought, it'd be no, as, as a, you know, it would be, could be plausible that perhaps one report that did have an optical counterpart. Yeah, okay, yeah, uh, that that is plausible. Um, anything else? Oh, no, except that um, I look forward to hearing um, Dr. Bellavis, um her future work on this. Did she said what else she's doing? She's uh, well, she's trying to get Telescope time for more observations. Okay, right. That's right now we're kind of, we're kind of in a, a valley where there's not a lot of space telescopes that are that are available to do surveys, but that will change, mm -hmm. and uh, the survey data will probably be where they find the answers to these questions. Well, and let's hope so. As the survey as the surveys get more sensitive, and that's really going to help us determine are these stars really missing or are they just, do they just get fainter or are they not even stars? They may be galaxies, you know, galact active galactic nuclei and uh, they just got fainter and now we can see them. There they are. Uh, Cause you know, you look at wise, wise could see a certain down to a certain level, yeah. but it, not below that. And uh, so a lot of the wise data, the, the wise was a great survey, but it, it, you could do a much more sensitive one. Yes. And uh, so I think that's, we're kind of have to be going to be patient. She's probably going to be, she's early career now. She's probably going to be mid-career before she has many, very oh, many yeah. answers. 
And, you know, and it's, it, there's a little danger, you know, when people, if you do something that's speculative, that, um, and speculative, you know, as I say, something which has an eye impact, but perhaps not as successful, you know, getting further employment may be slightly problematic. Yeah, I understand. And I'm sure that uh, lots of young astronomers are very sensitive to that. <laughs> oh, yes. And um, my, my gut feeling is that there's going to be a lot of more, there's going to be a bigger extra, um, extra galactic component when everything is sorted out. Uh, okay. That, that's, a, that's a reasonable uh, prognostication. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, for all knows, maybe there's a SETI signal. I always thought SETI was most likely, the first SETI would be most likely to be extra galactic and local. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I uh, thought I'd make a bet on it, even though a small bet. <laughs> a small bet. Well, <laughs> I mean, history says that. Well, stay tuned. I, I'm I'm keenly interested in what's possible. Uh, yeah. And so uh, th thanks for your time, uh, David. And, oh, uh, yeah, well, it's well, most welcome. Oh, one, I'm sorry. If you have a, a brief comment, I was going to come mention. She mentioned that they went through visually 24,000 <laughs> images. Yeah. And she, I've done only a fraction of that, and that is very tiring. Yeah. Well, the, you know, these they're young people. <laughs> they can stay up yeah. late. Uh, but uh, um, the, that, she actually did a lot of that herself. Uh, I'm impressed just on the being able to um, keep your eye. Your eye I strain at a minimum. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it, it was very hard work, which is what it's going to take to get anywhere, yeah. right? Uh, so, uh, well, thanks for your time, David, and I will, no I will uh, let you know what's going on, and we'll um, probably, uh, hopefully, this will stimulate some other astronomers to come on and give their opinions. That we'll put it out there and see what happens. Okay. All I'm right. Look forward to that. All right. Well, thanks a lot. All right, have a good night. Good night. Thank you, Dr. David Blink. And as always, anyone who has comments on any episode or burst of the wow signal should feel free to contact us you can always email wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com we'll get that you can leave a comment in the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com uh, you can contact us on twitter at podcast wow there's lots of ways to get in touch with us and we will be happy to talk to you and possibly even in some cases like this record a conversation about your comments and I really enjoyed this, and I hope we do many more of these. Well, uh, as always, there will be more information at wowsignalpodcast.com. This is Burst 33, if you're looking for it. Just click on the Bursts tab. There's a table of all the Bursts there, and you can go right to it. Or if it's recently after it comes out, it should be right there on the homepage at wowsignalpodcast.com. We'd love to see you over at patreon.com to help support the show. Now, these kinds of little short episodes, the bursts, are not billed to Patreon subscribers, only the longer episodes. So, And you don't pay by the month or week. You pay just by the episode, however much you think is appropriate. We don't encourage large donations. You know, Just a dollar or two per episode is, is fine. And you'll get all the perks that all the other Patreons get. And that will include early releases and other fun things. In fact, this particular release will be available to Patreon supporters uh, a couple of days before release. Now, you might have noticed that we're experimenting with new music here on The Burst for quite a long time. We have used music by Jason Robinson, and we very much appreciate his permission to do so. Uh, this is a little different. I thought we'd just try this once and see how it it goes. This is music by Lloyd Rogers tonight, he, who has made his music public domain, and we're very thankful for that. We may try a few new pieces of music before we hit upon a new Burst theme. So thank you for listening. This has been Burst 33 of The Wow Signal. For more information, 
please go to wowsignalpodcast.com.